so welcome to week 10, oh my god, of uh, communicating the crisis and beyond. This is where we're going to focus on building a marketing plan and it will be drawing on other webinars that we've done in the past. So I'll refer back to those in the series. If at any point uh, you want to review the ones in the past, they are at idealmarketingcompany.co.uk forward slash crisis hyphen communications if you scroll to the very bottom then all of the other videos are there and it will be helpful we started off by really talking about how to modify your marketing at this time so that your message is suitable for the time uh, that that we're in everyone felt a bit uncomfortable doing things as they usually would do as as is correct uh, but now we a lot of people are, are using this opportunity to review the marketing that they've been doing so far taking the opportunity to do the important things that have been on the to-do list and a marketing plan is definitely one of them. But building a marketing plan is a hunk of a subject to uh, be dealing with. So this will very much be a whistle stop tour, um, but it will give you a structure which hopefully will get you started and some resources where you can put things together. Um, it doesn't mean that you, you can't build a marketing plan based on what we're, what we're covering today. You absolutely can do and hopefully it will really get people started off in the right direction. So we're going to be going uh, starting with goal setting, business planning and sales planning because they can really help you develop a marketing plan that works. We'll look at market positioning as well. So really understanding where you are in your marketplace and what that means for the messaging. And then also uh, personas. So I talk about this all the time. It's probably, I think, the second one in the series because it's some fundamentals. So I'm not going to be going over that in too much detail. That will just be covering it lightly. But it is very important um, because then you will naturally be able to plan out the activities and also the marketing measurements that you pick. We will then move to a Q&A session. The first bit takes about 45, 50 minutes. Move to a Q&A session where the people who are here today get an opportunity to ask their, their questions, but it will be in private, it won't be on YouTube. So you get an opportunity to be anonymous and, um, and, and that's a benefit only for the people who are here now. The rest of the series, there's not many left. There's only two more in the series. Uh, you can go to idlemarketingcompany.co.uk for slash crisis hyphen communications, which is where you'll see the next two upcoming ones. The next one is on copywriting for your audience or producing content that is really honed in and engaging for them. And um, I'll decide what the final one is. So let's get started. Uh, at the end of the day, you are doing marketing because you want to get a business benefit, you want to get a return on investment. And that is always the challenge of marketing is it's proving a return on investment. The best way to start that is to decide exactly what you want from your business or what success looks like. So I would encourage you to go back to your business plan um, and particularly what your opportunity areas are um what your so it might be reviewing what your services are at the moment there's loads of templates out there at the end of the day this isn't a workshop on business planning but um i've got to touch on it really so what are the opportunity areas that you find for example is it that there's certain products and services that are easier more profitable to sell that you want to sell more of identify where those are uh, there might be that you could do with more of your existing customers knowing you so that's better market penetration uh, maybe it's for a new new product or a particular product you'd like to sell more of but you don't feel like they know you very well in which case a solution to that would be brand building exercises it may be that actually your opportunity is in cross-selling to your existing customers so there'll be different activities around that it might be upselling um, maybe getting more repeat buyers there might be things that you can do or encouraging referrals from your current base so have a look at what's been working for you historically and really where your growth opportunity areas are. That will very naturally lead into a sales plan. A sales plan is something that I only really did in the last couple of years. And there's uh, the sales manager, I'll provide a link actually, because I've just launched an online platform. They do a brilliant workshop on building a sales plan. And what you do is say, uh, all, the, all the overall structure, and it's delivered a lot more comprehensively than this, is, what, what kind of money do I want to get in per month or over the entire year? Where am I now and how do I close that gap? And what will that be made of? It might be made of X number of this product, of Y product, and then a number of 
B service um, in order to give you some sort of a target to really hold on to. And, you know, those decisions will be based on historical information, what you know sold before, but also going back to what those opportunity areas where you think, well, actually, I feel like I could be selling a lot more of this thing just by going back to my existing customers. Um, just to a quick subject on that it, it is an awful lot easier to sell to your existing customers than it is to find new ones so it, it will probably be a combination of of those um if you're looking for new customers there is marketing cost or, or much higher marketing cost involved so that has an impact on what investments you have to make so your sales plan will then more naturally lead into a marketing plan because if you're if you're saying well i want to sell x number of this to y customer then you know that um right what do i need to do to get in front of that customer what campaign should i be running in order to get in front of that customer and we're going to talk about personas but it's really helpful if um that is the beginning and my aim is to get to this the other thing is that then it's a lot easier to um, create a measurement that matters because if you've said I want to sell X products to Y, or at least generate that many leads. I mean, the job of marketing is to generate the leads, not so much, um, you know, to sell the product for you in all situations, but hopefully pre-qualified, that's, that's the job really. And then you're in a better position to tell if your marketing is doing a good job for you or is doing the job that it should be, because right at the beginning, you've outlined what it want, what, what you want to achieve. Sometimes with marketing, it can be a bit, um, the, the goals may be not lined up and because there isn't a target and because that's not vocalized verbalized um there can be a bit of frustration when when the results that you wanted aren't achieved but they were never really shared and they were never and they weren't reviewed so that's the reason why i really recommend generating a sales plan and then actually saying right this is what we want to do this is our target um what else do i want to say on that no that's it helps you with your marketing measurements as well. So before you move any further with building into personas and stuff like that, I would encourage you, maybe as part of your business plan, to review your market positioning. And the, a large degree of this um, is so that you can identify whether you really have a unique selling proposition or point. A lot of companies don't, but they maybe don't recognize that. Um, realistically the last thing that you want is to be stuck in the middle so if you don't have a usp and you don't recognize it then like it or not you are probably going to be uh, selling on on just on cost or on price um or maybe relationships and loyalty which can take quite a long time to to build so i actually identify where would you put yourself in this matrix and if you were to draw out all of your competitors where would you put them? I'll just review this quickly because it can be a little bit confusing. If you have a broad appeal, that could be maybe a, a supermarket or you're looking at maybe Heinz or something like that when you're looking at a, a mass market brand. If you're looking at narrow, this is maybe to a specific marketplace. This might be, for example, with I know that we've got a recruitment lady on the call, so it might be that they specialise in um, finance as an industry for example there might be a narrow focus what you can also do there's a difference between being having a niche and then targeting a particular industry so you could decide that we will we won't turn anybody away but we will specialize or, or um, we we work particularly well with an industry so there might be a a kind of a, a market appeal where you can really focus in. and this is where the personas are helpful and it's why it's useful to do this exercise first before moving on to personas. So, and if you look at the bottom, there's lower cost versus differentiation. I think this is something that people will more easily recognize that often you are either competing on price or you're competing on being unique. And normally if you're more unique, then more unique, that's grammatically incorrect. If you're, if you're different in that way, or if you position yourself based on differentiation, then you can normally uh, charge a premium price for it because it's based on something else uh, but if you're competing on price then it's going to be a constant race to the bottom so uh, differentiation uh, 
when you're looking at the, the top right quadrant, it means that you are providing something that's different from everybody else based on a particular feature, um, but you are appealing to everybody. The position of differentiation can be can, is a really powerful one to be in, but unfortunately it doesn't necessarily take that long before somebody comes up behind you and, cop and can often copy what you do. Apple is a pretty good example of this where they are a leader, but they have to continue to innovate and continue to put money into research and development because it doesn't take long before everybody else comes out with Bluetooth headphones, for example, or tablets or you know they, things like that. So it isn't a permanent position. If you uh, dedicate yourself to that, it, it requires continu continuous investment into, into maintaining that position. Um, if you have a differentiation, differentiation focus, it's specialised within industry, um, I can't even give an example of that because it's probably going to be quite niche. But um, if you're looking at a cost focus, then it's not actually a focus on cost. It's being um, price based and also to be focused in a niche. So in your own in your own industry and cost leadership isn't leading based on cost. It's actually um, leading uh, sorry it is leading based on on cost but in, in a broad sense so that that's the only thing that could be a little bit confusing about this model but put yourself on here wherever you think you are and where you're um where you think your competition are if you feel that everyone's clustered in one one of these then think about what you can do to be different um is there a way that you can provide some something else because that is going to then build, bring into your messaging which is the next phase where we will be looking at your personas. So like I said, personas are the second one in the series. This is an overview of just some of our personas. I think we've got maybe nine or 10 actually in the end and, and they do develop over time. Um, so we serve in the main business owners and marketing managers, so and also sales managers um, with business owners. There are different sizes of them as well. But there's also different attitudes to bear in mind. So some people um, may want to be very involved with the, the marketing and do things themselves, whilst also um, uh, whilst also outsourcing some of their marketing, or if some just want to be hands off and just want to get on with it. And it's recognising that for us so that we uh, provide the best value to them and also have the best relationship with them. And that's what's very, very helpful is, is knowing um, who your customers are so that you can engage with them in the right way, provide the right products and service and, and speak, speak to them. So here's an example of what just one of them, one of these people would look like. Um, what I have done is written at the top, the desirable behavior, what really we would like to happen as a result, be explicit about that because it helps you to a manage the new business relationship, but also how you then move them on. Because if you want a repeat relationship or you want them to be a brand advocate, um, which will help hopefully lead to uh, repeat business and um, you know, that, that will help with your business plan. Then what explicit steps can you do to encourage those things? That could be very helpful. Um, your undesirable behavior, what we would recognize is that um, if somebody is doing everything themselves, then often they, they don't have much time. So we need to be very proactive about managing that relationship so that they um, feel that they, they are getting the most out of, out of us and, and to support them when we can do. The real focus here is getting to their key drives and motivations. What is it that they're looking to achieve? Um, what is it that's keeping them up at night? What do they want to feel at the end from, from our service? And also their pain points and concerns so that we can deal with them initially, like right up front. Because often people don't necessarily share what their objections are or their pain points. They might, um, so if you put what, put your, um, I suppose your response, then, uh, which is often a guarantee to be honest, then you put that up front and they never have to admit what their concern is which not, not many people do. Validations is more about what you can do to make them feel confident right at the end that this is the right person, um, make them, help them feel that they trust you. So case studies, accreditations, awards, qualifications, case studies that are specific to their industry are all very helpful. And then you build up your key messages as a result of all of this stuff that makes it easy. It doesn't need to be Shakespeare. It can just be some bullet points that then someone else can write up properly, but get it down on paper. What is it that you need to be getting across to these people?
on the right hand side of the profile attributes which are different depending on whether it's business to consumer or business to business if it's business to consumer you are dealing with demographics like age gender hobbies family situation if it's business to business you are dealing with job position uh, size of the company that they work in are they a decision maker and if not is it somebody else who's involved uh, and as a result of all that you can more easily figure out how it's best to get in front of them whether that's through your website and search engine optimization pr a combination of, of all sorts of different things and it really helps with the marketing plan the output of these personas are key messages that you want to engage with people with and where exactly you should be going to do that so those are the, the main things uh, what also might be helpful for you to do is to write in what products and services you really aim to give them it might be actually that there's an opportunity to develop a new product or a new service which responds directly to the pain points and the drivers that you recognize that they have and another use very useful exercise is to put examples in particularly if you're sharing this with other people the examples help for them to um, connect who this person is with the person that they know uh, what you can also do is draw a box where you've got all of your personas and then put all of your existing and past clients into those boxes if you find that not all of your clients will fit in then that means that you maybe have got a couple of personas or persona that you haven't included so there is more to that but that's in a whole other thing so uh, write out as a result of like i said as a result of your personas you should be able to write out your key messages um, and where they are and also write out your targeting options I would really encourage you to prioritize because otherwise your marketing plan is going to become a lot more difficult. If you prioritize the personas where you have the biggest opportunity, then you then start your marketing plan by focusing on them rather than everything. And the fact is for a lot of people, the reason why they're developing a marketing plan is because they feel overwhelmed by all the different options that they have in front of them. They feel like they should be doing email marketing and building their list and also on LinkedIn and, you know that that's that's those are the processes that people go through so if you prioritize your personas then you you start with that highest priority one um your priorities for your personas will normally be based on it could be based on timeline for example if you know that you need to get business in quickly and uh, this particular persona you know how to work with them you can access them quickly and your quote to getting them on board time period is shorter then you probably prioritize those people when um, you might not do under other circumstances so it may be that your best customers that you'd really like do take quite a long time and there's several people involved in the decision making process so you can think about them and do them uh, further down the line once you know that you've maybe sort the cash flow issue out um, but it, it would be very those personas will be based on the situation you're in at the moment and the business that you have your priorities can change over time and they can evolve uh, in particular at the moment dealing with COVID-19 um, your priorities may also be different uh, it may be that a particular industry which has had to stall because of this situation they are no longer your priority because they, they honestly can't make any decisions and they haven't got the budget to play play with the other thing that's helpful with the persona exercise considering this COVID-19 crisis is uh, what is going on for them at the moment so you might add another extra couple of fields that is very specific to the current circumstances how are they affected is there a, a way in particular that you can help them at the moment to to respond to what's going on so that's another exercise that's quite important so as a result of going through the exercise um, the the preceding exercises you will get probably have a list of activities where you can plot them i'm going to actually give you a, a plan spreadsheet that we we use for managing what we're doing with our clients but the common fields to fill out is what the activity is and it might be that you also have the area what key dates there are uh, allocations that means who's responsible so if you have a team this might be a field if it's all for you then it's a bit more tricky but decide who's going to be allocated the work also how long it might take and how long something's got so you might start off by saying oh well i'm going to do all of these things on the first of july and actually when you go through the durations column and how long you're going to need realistically to do these things you may find that um right well, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna change the dates um what can be very helpful we use smart sheet which has a project management uh 
facility built in. We do have the paid plan, but there are, there are free versions. And what's great there is that you can add dependencies. What that means is if, uh, for example, you have a range of activities and you can't do the fourth one until the third and the second, the first is done, then you can add them as dependencies. And it means that if there is a delay in finishing the first in line, then automatically it will move the dates on. And you get a very clear idea of um, how important it is to do something on time, and what the uh, implication is if something isn't done in time. And also if there is a deadline, that you have to work to, you can put that in as well, which is really, really helpful. Uh, before I do move on to showing you what the plan might look like as a format, you're also going to need to consider what resources are needed. Do you need external help? Have you got the expertise in house to do everything? Um, and if not, then it's worth starting sooner rather than later on getting that external help, whether that's with a, a marketing company such as ourselves, um, or whether you need a new um, well, yeah, just a marketing company like this. <laughs> I'm just trying to think, um, yeah, whether you need something produced um, for you. You might have somebody already that you use. It might be that you need external help from somebody from your website company that you've already got, for example. Will a budget be required? For example, if you are going to need to go out there to um, new a new audience rather than going back to your existing customers, then you are going to require more of a budget. Uh, there also may be a advertising budget for any kind of digital advertising or print advertising and there'll be a printing budget as well. And uh, if you are missing the skills in-house but actually it's worth the investment to have them in-house, there's a skills gap, then what training requirements might there be? Even if you manage to get some free training, that's going to take time out of the office and time to get them up to, um, so that, that's something that, that needs allowing for. Also, do you need to invest in any software in order to do what you want, whether that's going to be email marketing, for example, there's a lot of free solutions out there, uh, but it depends on how big your list is and they don't all, they're not all, all equal. MailChimp, that's the commonly used one and that is free up to a certain amount. Uh, but if you are looking to do automated campaigns, for example, that's a paid option. So think about that with your budget as well um, up front so that you don't end up with runaway costs. So this is what a, a plan structure can look like. Obviously I haven't put anything in there, but I start with a task name. And then when you aim to start it and end it, who it's assigned to, the duration, and um, whether this is a repeat activity and how frequently things are repeated. The uh, duration could, you might have a start date and you might have an end date as in, um, you know, they might be a week apart, but realistically somebody needs a solid day in order to do that that's the difference between start and end date and duration otherwise they seem very similar if they then are like i'm not going to have a solid day within that week to do this thing uh, then then you would tinker with the end date so the duration almost ends up being a number one how much of this person's time will this require can we afford that considering whatever else they've got are they going to realistically be able to meet the end date so that's really helpful um, to have in, in place the other thing that you can do with task name is that you can divide them down into different areas. So for us, we often will do search engine optimization and then we also might do PR for somebody. Um, and then we might do some uh, website updates, which are kind of they're, they're not strictly split, speaking search engine optimization. There might be a feature or something like that. Um, it might be social media, whatever. But what we normally do is we have a heading of social media and then underneath all of the tasks that are, might be required. The same thing for SEO. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to um, group tasks and make sure that nothing's missing as well. If you have all of them um, grouped together, then that, that can make it a little bit more difficult. So repeat activities are ones that you're going to be wanting to do monthly. Uh, the fact is if you're starting out with a marketing plan, then upfront you're probably going to need to spend quite a bit of time on setting things up, whether that's creating a MailChimp account, creating your social media account, maybe doing some initial research in order that the ongoing activities are, are more effective and more likely to, to work. So um, if something is one off, then it, it helps to know that because it's not quite so overwhelming. And you know, right, well, this, once this is done, then we're going to move to repeat work. The other thing is that if um, if it is repeat work, like having social, writing, producing social media, creating an email newsletter, for example, then 
what the the um, time that that person is going to have to spend every month needs to be allowed for. They need the space and the time to do that. And also at what intervals. Some things are repeat, but they're not every month. That might be quarterly reports that need running. Uh, it depends on how frequently you're going to do activities. Um, it might be that you decide to only do PR once a, a quarter, or it could be a, an exhibition or a show that's only once every six months or once every year. So that kind of interval just helps to uh, plan out what's going to happen. Um, that kind of awareness also means that um, you don't end up with a cluster of activities all at once. If you know that all of your activities are going to come in one month, then what are you going to do to make that manageable? Um, how can you and not just end up with having to deal with it on that particular month, which, which can be very, very difficult. So that kind of awareness is helpful. Um, once you've written that out and agreed it with everybody and it's been assigned, then it means you can come back to it. Another helpful box on here is a done checklist. Uh, so that that is really useful as well. And also confirming um, how, whether the, the, the thing took as long as you thought it did. At first, it's not going to be right. It might take a bit longer and um, it can stop you from feeling frustrated if you just say you, we thought it was going to take this long. But if you if you if you internally, obviously, this is something where we know how long something takes, uh, but that can really help to manage expectations ongoing as well. So right next, moving on to measuring success. Uh, if you've got a marketing plan, which is based on your business results, this is an awful lot easier to do. Measuring marketing is an awful lot easier with digital marketing, um, but I. I always want to begin any talk about marketing measurement by saying just because you can't measure marketing doesn't mean that it isn't valid and helpful. Any brand building activity is very, very hard to measure. There are indicators of it, which we'll talk about very briefly, um, but there are not the hard and fast um, rules. But brand building exercises at the moment are very important because um, any hard selling or outbound marketing is not going to be viewed very favorably when particularly at the beginning of the crisis i think i think people are, are you know the market's moving again or the markets are moving again uh, but they inbound activities which is where people come to you or they're looking for you and looking for content uh, which are, are more brand building activities are far more likely to be looked upon favorably at the moment they're not the hard sell they're more about getting to know you so there is a place for and there will always be a place for brand building activities that help people to know like and trust you which gets them over the finish line gets them to to buy into you at the end and, and is a very important part um so those those will always exist and you are kind of talking about your social media activities where there are engagement rates but you can't see a direct line between one like and a sale further down the line um, PR is, is another example where it's very, very powerful. It can make you look a lot bigger as a company. In the end, the buying decision might even be based on that, but it's very hard to prove. But where marketing can be measured is particularly in digital marketing. And Google Analytics is a brilliant free tool for that. There are other tools out there, of course, but um, a lot of people have got Google Analytics installed on their website. If you haven't, I encourage you to just put it on there because it only starts measuring from the data it's on. Uh, on your website and if you want it um, you know if you want the information in the future it's on then, then that's tough but google analytics can feel like a very overwhelming subject and this is another webinar in the series it's maybe in the middle i think uh, google analytics and, and marketing measurement so i go into far more detail and introduce the digital marketing measurement model i said that uh, first time and um and all sorts of other things in there and the really specific tools which i'm not going to go through today but the, the problem is that there's an awful lot of information in there and not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts i've just talked about brand building activities uh, where that's the not everything that counts can be counted that's just that uh, but when we're looking at your google analytics not everything that can be counted counts and that's where we look at vanity metrics there's this difference between vanity and clarity I haven't got it on this this presentation uh, but a vanity metric is often where people actually focus on google analytics they have a habit of saying oh we've got these many visitors and it's up from the month before okay but are those people then buying from you are they generating leads are they actually bots 
you know, so if you only think about these num these large numbers like visits to your website and not what the business result of that is, then it's a vanity metric. A clarity metric is saying we have got more visits, which was generated by improving our search engine result position. So our, our position in search engines for certain keywords have gone up. But the result of that, we have got more visits and we have then seen more inquiries as a result of that. Um, based on our current conversion rate, if we continue as we're going, then uh, we're going to continue to get this business results. So that's the kind of uh, metric that's helpful. So where to start with any kind of marketing measurement, set up your goals. Hopefully you've done that from right at the beginning of this. Uh, so it all, all comes full circle. What is it that you're hoping to achieve? You've got that sentence at the beginning. Uh, and that's the fact is with any kind of Google Analytics webinar or, or workshop that I do, in order to make the most Google Analytics, you spend quite a bit of time outside of Google Analytics first, talking to the decision maker or if the decision maker is you, thinking about what exactly it is that you, you want to achieve. Um, if you decide what your goals are, that would then impact your marketing strategy, which we've just gone through. And as a result of your marketing strategy, you're in a better position to pick the measurements, key performance indicators and targets. So here's an example basing, based on an e-commerce website. I use that uh, because it's a very easy one to use, but if you are service-based, um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So the objective would be to in increase sales. Your goal uh, will be to increase conversion rates. So these are just, there's loads of different ways of, in, of, of increasing sales, but I'm just gonna pick two. So increasing the conversion rate for people who come through to your website to actually buy, and then also increasing the customer spend per customer. The different ways that you could, that that could lead into your marketing strategy is if you want to increase your conversion rate, you wanna look at your user experience, where it is that people exit the website, are people on mobile and actually they're not having great experience on mobile. Um, are there other things that are more likely to help them to really buy in the end? What, where are they disappearing? So that involves a, a, a user experience audit, talking with your web developer, maybe the website's not quick, quick enough, for example, just to identify what the technical problems might be that are in the way. So those are the things that you would end up, tasks that you would end up looking at. If you want to increase your customer spend per customer, then you might um, bundle things together, give free postage over a particular order value. So say, for example, your average order value is £35 and you want to get it up to 50 then give free shipping over over £50. Um, bundle products together that um, would be over £50, for example, maybe with a site discount. Um, you might also, um, if you are looking for more repeat, if you're looking at that customer spend per customer, that's be a repeat buyer, you might do email marketing um, to follow up with people after a certain amount of time with a coupon code to come back to refer you, um, you know, to, to check in and stuff like that. So those are the marketing activities you do as a result of those goals. Your key performance indicator, this just might look like I'm repeating myself, but actually what it is is the measurement that is in Google Analytics for you to look at. So your conversion rate is one of them and your average order value is the other thing to measure. Um, then the target is drawing a line in the sand. You might be basing this on your previous year or you might just say, you know what, I'm just going to go for this. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. So in this example, I'm going to increase my conversion rate from 5% to 10%. You know, it's doubling it, so that'd be amazing. Um, and increase my average order value from 20 to 25. If you know that you had so many customers last month, last month, year, whatever, then you know what the impact would be. Um, and this would also be part of, you can see how this kind of wraps up within your sales plan as well. So I mentioned that you, uh, if you're a service-based customer instead, then what you probably be wanting is for somebody to fill out your form. This, an e-commerce website, the tracking would be e-commerce tracking because then you can get the actual value of the order. That's the, the point with e-commerce is you actually know how much money is coming through and you need that setting up. Uh, the other thing that you can do is setting up a goal and that is when you, you tell Google Analytics, a successful visit to my website would be somebody completing this action. So it might be clicking on a phone number, which you can do on mobile. Can't track it on a uh, desktop, but you might as well put the tracking in place. It might be clicking on an email, it might be filling out a form, it might be doing quite a few different things, but that's normally it. So for a service-based professional, uh, that that is probably what you're looking for them to do. So you can set up goals in Google Analytics to say, if somebody lands on this page or clicks on this thing, 
that is a conversion for me. And really, it's not a conversion as far as a sale is concerned, but it is a, it's a lead, really. So it's, it's a conversion in Google Analytics, but from a business term, it, it's when a lead is created. The things that can be measured is going to a location on the website, completing an action, time spent on the site, and a number of pages visited. The last two are only really helpful if you're um, if you've got like a blog website or something, so you're selling attention or AdSense, and um, you you wouldn't normally want people to visit a lot of pages because it could be an indication, could be an indication, it might not be that they're not finding what they want. So the first two are really the main ones that we focus on. If you go to a location on a website, it might be the the next page, for example, somebody gets after filling in a form. So successful, this is great. And that page will be hidden from Google, um, Google's index. So people could only get there if they fill the action. So you could say the success page would be a conversion. Really what it should be um, is completing an event action. So if you click on submit on a form, that can also be an action. Um, completed. So there's those two different ways of measuring filling out a form. Um, the the main difference, and this is a whole other thing to go into, but the main difference is that an event, you can't put pages that people need to have visited before completing the event. So if there's a very specific funnel that you want for somebody to go through in order for it to be completed as an action, then you're going to focus on the, on the first one, on the destination. Right. So what the, the other thing to think about when you're deciding what your goals are is that not all goals are created equal. This is an example of what goals might look like. So some might be revenue generating, some might be acquisition of an account, some might be an inquiry and some might be engagement. Um, I wouldn't encourage you to just put as many goals as you want, just you know, to, to go crazy and go, yeah, if somebody signs up to a new money newsletter, that's definitely an engagement and so is somebody filling out a form, sorry, a, a conversion. And the reason why is because from a business perspective, they're not all created equal for you. So if something is revenue generating, then that's definitely a business, you know, that definitely has an impact on the bottom line. Um, if somebody fills creates an account or requests a quote, then that's a really hot lead. And then we're getting kind of cooler as we go along. So filling out an email or a form, that is not so much of a, you know, a, um, a definite benefit to the business. An engagement, a newsletter sign up, that is good, but it's, it's not as good as the top one. And the thing is with uh, goals in Google Analytics is either you've completed one or you haven't. It's zero or it's one if you leave it as standard, but you can assign a value to it if you want. So there can be a sliding scale. So just think about that when you're deciding what goals to, to put in place. So I'm gonna repeat myself here. <laughs> uh, the goal, like I said, a conversion is really a lead and it's equal to one uh, in any reporting. So assign a value, you've got lots of goals. And I'll have a list here, you know, really what will make a difference. What can you track? You might need to change your website so that you can track a convert. That's quite a normal thing to say, right, well, actually there isn't anything. So we need to add a form or we need to add these links in. Um, that, that's a completely normal thing to do. Uh, so think about what the value is to you. If nothing else, I would encourage you to actually A, check you've got Google Analytics on your website <laughs> and B, just set up those goals because equally, the goals will only start tracking from the day that you add them in. They, you cannot get historical information on, on this to go back to. It's going to make the information a lot more valuable. Uh, so what I've done is there's quite a bit of information here that I'm going to actually skip, skip through because um, there is a whole other webinar on this subject and it means that we can move to uh, Q&A, um, but all of this is in that in there as well. Right, I'm actually going to go over here. So reporting insight, because this is relevant to your marketing plan. Um, if you've set up and agreed what your goals are right at the outset and then produce your marketing plan, rep providing reporting insight at regular agreed intervals is an important thing to remember to go back and, and, and do. So have those original business objectives and goals so that you can go back to them. Um, it also, at the end of the day, if you are reporting to anybody, it makes you look an awful lot better. This is what promotions and career progression can be based on. It's saying, we agreed this, 
and we achieve this and, and having that consistently to come back on. If you're going to, uh, if you are going to um, talk about any, any data or metrics, I would encourage you to always put in which means, so decipher what the information means. Uh, the quickest way to turn people off who don't do an awful lot of reporting is to, to go into a lot of detail on reporting. So always decipher what you think it means. So um, particularly where maybe you might have fallen short of the target or you might have exceeded it or you might have spotted something else. It's pretty normal actually to, to just find something else along the lines and go, right, well, actually, we, um, we recommend as a result of this, this is the next thing we do. You can also use Google Analytics to investigate the reasons behind something. So it might be that you've noticed uh, you, you might have noticed something and, or you, you've fallen short of a target. That's, a re that's when all of the massive amount of data in Google Analytics is helpful because then you can go and investigate it. But you're investigating it not based on, well, let's just try and find some data. It is still aligned to those marketing objectives that you had. Like, why is it that we've fallen short of our goal? Um, you know, why, why is it that our conversion rate is still not as high? As, as we'd like what can what can we do um and is there anywhere else in the in that kind of marketing journey where people might be falling short now there is also the last one that we did was on marketing journeys so you can go back and or customer journey sorry um so you can go back and have a look at that then scheduling future meetings and updates just to make sure that people really see the return on that marketing investment that they've made the last thing you want is for someone to be coming to you and going right what do we, you know, where's, where's this thing? You don't want them to be chasing you. We had this meeting. I don't really feel that confident that we're progressing or, or where we are. So the resources that are available, there's a persona template, uh, which was sent around with the persona review meeting, which I will send as a follow up to this uh, that you can download. There's also a marketing plan template, which can be downloaded with a, um, a there's a free Gantt chart there. I would also highly recommend anybody who's interested in measuring success to go to Avinash Kushik to review his information. Google Data Console is a really nice way. Um, data Studio is a really nice way to create pie charts that bring in data and help them easier to decipher if you are reporting on a regular basis. Optimize your Google Analytics account with a blog, which again, I will link to and um, I'll send all this on a follow-up email. So next in the series, we're doing the marketing plan today and uh, there's going to be writing for your audience. It's going to be next. Um, I'd also be interested to know if there's anything remaining that you want to learn about. We've been pretty comprehensive with the subjects actually over the series. Uh, but if there's one last thing that you want for episode 12, please do let me know. And especially if there's someone who you think would be a really great guest, about two thirds of these have been with with a, a marketing expert in a specialist area. But again, you can view future updates and join the newsletter at idlemarketingcompany.co.uk forward slash crisis hyphen communications.